with me today I have Kevin McLeod who is often following elaborate building projects but today is speaking to me instead so Kevin thank you for joining me today. I'm delighted to be at home in the warm and in the dry it's great. Yeah best place to be. Um, so Kevin you speak English, French, Italian and German why that particular selection of languages? Uh, to completely have not start school. Um, I think anybody learning a language now should be looking at learning uh, Spanish, given the number of people, uh, number of countries it's spoken in, and probably uh, Mandarin, given the importance mm -hmm. of that language internationally going forwards. But um, for me, it was just that I went to a village primary school uh, where we had a, a lady who was French, who was one of our class teachers. And so she taught, she stopped from the age of what, six or something, I was learning French. Um, and that was just happenstance. Um, and then when I got to grammar school, I discovered everything there I'd already learned, you know. So I was kind of ahead of the game. Then I did O-level and A-level. And then I got a place to study languages at Cambridge. And in my uh, naivety coming from what was then a comprehensive, um, I, I, I just thought I could go and study Italian. And they said, look, you do understand this is a literature course. And uh, in order to, to study the language, you need to be able to speak it. So go away. So I did. I went off to Italy for a year and a half and, um, and, and learned Italian and lived there and got to that point where, you know, you, you sort of, you, you can dream in a language. So I, I became reasonably proficient at that. But I have to tell you, very funnily, I, when I learned Italian, aged 18, 19, um, after a year of just completely immersed in this country, trying to pick up this language, I'd forgotten all my French. So the same storage um, area of my brain had been used for this new language, as opposed to the French, which had been kind of shoved to one side. I mean, it later came back and it sort of almost reversed in a way. German, I only took to, to O level. So I'm, I'm you know, it's uh, sehr klein. Um, but, but, the, but, but I also uh, studied music and, um, so I've got quite a musical ear, so I, I can pick up languages quite easily. And I think that's, I think it's partly facility and partly having the ear for, you know, being able to impersonate. I mean, there's, there's, they say the best way to speak French is to read French in a French accent, as though you're acting being a French person. And, and so, and it's the same with the Italian, you know. So in fact, and we can come on to this really, but I think that when you, when you speak another language and you do it that way, you, you, you know, you, you actually you adopt mannerisms, but you also kind of slip into the mentality of another culture. And I think that's kind of quite, that's quite interesting. I read that you studied opera in Italy. Is that true? <laughs> yeah, it is true. I, I, so I went to study Italian. I did a course. Um, I then got a job working on a farm in Tuscany uh, with a family. Um, so, and, and it just so happened they knew someone who, who, uh, whose daughter was, at the conservatory in Florence, and I sang a lot. I mean, I'd been singing through school and, and trained, and and and, uh, and they said, well, you should go and have an audition. So I went to the conservatory and got a place, and um, I did that for a year. And then they offered me a three-year place and uh, uh, to carry on, to, you know, to kind of like degree level. And I, 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 I said um, uh, to my dad, and also to my singing teacher, Ivor Davis, who was a big influence in my life. Um, I said, look, I'm gonna stay and do this course because it's amazing. And, and my father wrote me one of, I think, two letters that he wrote in his life to me and, and saying, no, you're not, you're coming back to England, you're going to Cambridge. Um, and Ivor, bless him, who was on holiday in Italy, made a detour down to Tuscany. Now, this was in 1987, so it's, you know, before the days of mobile phones and when everything was sent by letter, I mean, you know, he found his way to come and visit me in the middle of nowhere to say, no, you, you really must go to Cambridge. So, um, and, and the option was always to come back, which I never took up. So I, 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 instead I went and did languages and, and changed and then did history of art and architecture and, you know, um, and, and actually did a part one in philosophy on the way through as well. So I kind of, I have to say my education was, was um, uh, chaotic. That's a, that's a good way to describe it. Is it chaotic or just varied and really interesting? <laughs> well, I, I suppose it's because I'd always done art and I, I, you know, I was very much on the art side. So I painted a lot, I did art A-level. I really wanted to go to art school. Mm -hmm. 
really, really wanted to go to art school. But because I was also academic, my headmaster, who had been the headmaster at the grammar school before it became comprehensive, said to me, you are Oxbridge material. And my parents, who were not wealthy, um, also saw this, um, this hope, you know, in me, this, that, you know, that there was an opportunity to go. My dad was the first person in his family to go to, to, to do anything like a university or, you know, post-school uh, education. And my, my mum never, she left school when she was younger. So um, it was, yeah, it was a big thing for me to have this place. And I think, I think there was a sort of degree of channeling and excitement about that, which I kind of went along with. But I, I still, I, I think my education um, suffered its, its sort of chaotic route, backwards and forwards, zigzagging, um, the road less traveled. Uh, <laughs> Really, because I all the time I wanted to to do to do things that involve painting and drawing and and so um, it, it's a sort of I, I, I kind of muddled my way through, but the languages were very helpful because in studying the history of art, history of architecture, you're suddenly presented with a text in German with no translation uh, and a huge dictionary that you've got to muddle your way through with, and or in Italian, you know, uh, and. Um, so it's and it's been useful ever since, technically. Yeah, because obviously architecture. You saying you studied architecture in England in Cambridge, but obviously architecture isn't just about buildings in England. It's about buildings everywhere. So, would you say? Well, you... I, yeah, I studied the history of architecture. So I was studying the, the history of the modern movement in the nineteen twenties in, 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 in Germany and France, and uh, and in at the. Um, the, the Bauhaus the, 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 and the growth of, of the kind of major 20th century uh, design movements, which, which actually linked architecture to writing, poetry, culture, um, movements like Dadaism. Would you say you, through doing that course, you improved your language skills or were, were the language skills there already and they came in useful in the course? There's only one way to, I think, learn a language properly. And I've tried different ways. I've tried recently learning languages, you know, before you go on holidays or mm. to Iceland and Greece. And I thought, oh, I'll, you know, try and at least be able to order a cup of coffee in those languages. And it's very hard when you're sitting in the car on the way to a meeting or at home with your earphones on trying to sort of learn a language in this sort of vacuum, in isolation. At school, we learned um, French and German in a, what was then called a language laboratory, which was lots of little booths. Where we all had earphones on and we had to listen to tapes and then play back and our teacher would listen in individually to what we were saying. And that was all about trying to improve pronunciation and response. But I have to say, difficult to do compared to being in a country. And suddenly when you're immersed in a culture and you, you need to communicate the fact that your wallet's just been stolen or that um, you've missed the last bus or that um, you actually kind of rather like the person you're talking to and maybe they'd like to go on a date. Suddenly, language becomes hugely important and, and you've got an enormous motivation to learn it. And you're also learning it in conversation with people all the time. And the moment you go into it, the moment you kind of immerse yourself in, in a difficult situation, you just have to adapt. Human beings are enormously resilient. Uh, uh, but learning a language in that environment is so different, it's so much easier than, than trying to do it in, in a sort of vacuum. So the, the, the best way, without a doubt in my view, is to go somewhere, go and run on a course somewhere formally to begin with, maybe for a month, you know, but then actually just make friends there, get involved in conversation. Yeah, and the last thing we should all be doing is kind of clinging on to our, our kind of British English. The terrible thing now, of course, you've got a mobile phone. So wherever you are in the world, you can carry on kind of being friends with your mates back home. Um, and communicating, phoning, texting, writing in your own language. And actually, uh, when, I, when I was in Italy, I, 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 admittedly, I, I was so green when I arrived in Italy on the train, so I'd taken a train across Europe, that um, when I was approaching Florence, I'm, uh, and I said, I'm going to Florence, and, and nobody in the carriage spoke English, they were all Italian, and I said, is Florence the next stop? And nobody understood me. And they kept saying, Firenze, Firenze, mm -hmm. yeah, which is the Italian word for Florence. I had no idea. I had no idea that that had a completely different name in Italian. Um, so I was that naive. Um, 
so you've you've I, I can't tell you how fundamentally important that the, the whole process of immersion is and then you went from that to studying opera so clearly immersion in a country no, well, in yeah. Italian well that was kind of quite a yeah, <laughs> yeah apparently I sang whenever I sang in class I I would sing with an English accent but when I spoke Italian I spoke with an, more of an Italian accent and I could never figure that out except to, to assume that that I'd always, when I'd sung in England, I, you know, I'd, a bit of my brain was doing the music thing and it was pronouncing the words as I saw it in the score um, and always had done. And, when, and then I'd gone off and done the verbal Italian thing, conversational thing over here. And the two were not quite connected, but that, that, that improved a bit with time. Yeah, so could you go to an opera now and sing along and understand what they're saying? Yeah, 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 yeah. Absolutely, yeah. Yeah, you give me a, yeah, I mean, the lovely thing about Italian is that um, it's it, 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 it's such an interesting and diverse country because it was only unified, of course, in 1870, around then. And, and prior to that, it was a number of separate states, each of which had its own language. And still today, if you go to the Veneto and you walk into a cafe uh, and you're going to meet somebody, as you go in, you'll hear people speaking in Veneto. And then if you're an Italian from Florence and you approach, they'll turn to you and they'll all start speaking in what we know as Italian. So it's a little bit like going to Wales, and, you know, and, mm. and finding that. Except that in the UK, we've, we've, we almost at one point lost our regional languages and they've, they've, they've actually depended on really quite vociferous um, movement in order to re-establish them. In Italy, that, that, that kind of cohesion, that... that uh, that, that bringing together of these different nation states with their different languages and, and, and um, their different dialects, which are really strong, stronger than here. Um, that, that didn't happen until the, later on in the 19th century. So, so although Tuscan Italian was effectively adopted by Dante, who was Tuscan from Florence, uh, and that was sort of effectively adopted as a national language, um, in the Middle Ages, nevertheless, these strong regional dialects are still really powerful, and uh, uh, and and it's quite hard. You know, you can you can read an opera score from the nineteenth century. It's easier than reading a poem written in a regional dialect now. Um, so uh, it, it works slightly different. I mean, what we have in, with with English as a language, we have this codified, um, uh, agreed grammar and syntax and vocabulary which even if you're living in the Northeast or in Wales or Australia or on the West Coast of America, um, we, we, is, is, a, is a kind of common um, tool uh, that we all understand. Whereas it's not quite the same in Italy. Mm. Yeah. You're now well known for presenting grand designs where you follow often unusual building projects that people are embarking on. And you've presented a series of this abroad as well. Did this put your language skills to use? Oh yeah, so I was able to ask, you know, Italian masons what the technique was for mm. using, you know, some concrete reinforcement in an earthquake area, that kind of thing. Yeah, and speaking to Italian planning officers, <laughs> it was mm. very, very useful to an extent, although my knowledge of Italian planning vocabulary is not the greatest. But um, yeah, that was, and I, I enjoyed that. I really enjoyed putting it to use. I had to tell you, it's very funny because Grand Designs has been now, um, it's been uh, broadcast in, I think it's 147 different ter uh, territories, separate mm -hmm. countries, and um, done a lot, including, of course, Italy and France. And um, the interesting thing is that in those markets, which are being European, they're quite large markets, uh, they dub rather than subtitle. Someone like Denmark, they tend to subtitle a lot of British ones, which is why, for example, the Danes and Dutch have such a fantastic command of English because they grew up watching British television and, and American television programs. But Grand Designs gets dubbed into Italian and dubbed into French. But apparently, and this has really annoyed me because I always pri pri prided myself on, on my accent, you know, being able to kind of really, really tune the accent of the language I'm speaking. speaking. And, um, and apparently I've got a really, really quite poor accent. They give me a really bad English accent when I speak Italian in the Italian version, which I really resent. Yeah, I, I can see that. 
try your best and then get given an awful accent. Yeah, yeah, exactly. When you were presenting Grand Designs abroad, was it um, for people who are from those countries having houses built or were there people who were emigrating to a new country? They were Brits abroad. Um, and so some of them were dealing with the, the difficulties of language. And indeed, we were sometimes offering the role of informal translators, trying to kind of <laughs> pass. We had, I remember once having a planning meeting with the local mayor in France on a project, which actually did, we'd stop working on. It didn't come to fruition because the couple just couldn't enmesh themselves very easily into the language. She, she was living in a caravan wearing white lace, writing her books. And he was, um, he was, he used to walk the dog every morning in his, um, plus fours you know it, it was kind of they were kind of hilariously British in a way you know and quite uh, because they didn't have the language they were quite isolated and couldn't couldn't really I think it was to do something like getting a phone line or the water put in or something like that and you know in France the, the general suspicion is as in Italy in so, so many European countries oh unless you know unless you're prepared to pay cash you nothing will happen whereas in fact I've often found that it's not it's not a question of a black market or even a grey market. It's simply the fact that if you want something done, you have to go and talk to the right person. And if your cousin happens to know the mayor, or if you know your your wife's aunt happens to be married to somebody quite high up in the water company, that really helps because it's all about who you know. It's about actually working personal relations. That's all, and contacts. And so we often found ourselves, yeah, sitting in rooms. Uh, with executives or, 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 you know, somebody from the mayor's office, just trying to kind of communicate something that we were filming, but we just knew wouldn't get used in the film at all because it, it, it wasn't relevant to the story. We, we were just trying to help push the, push the project along. But these were all Brits abroad, some of whom had fantastic command of the language and really integrated themselves. I mean, there's one couple in France, Doug and Denny, who, who took an, a, a war time, an ancient uh, 18th century building which had been used by the Nazis during the war and um, and it was a derelict building and they kind of brought it back to life as a and b and and kind of helped revitalize an entire community and, and what was glorious was meeting going back actually for the revisit and a few years later and meeting the locals all of whom had kind of welcomed them into mm. their community partly because they were contributing adding to the local economy but also because they bothered to learn the language. They were really, really engaged with becoming part of that French place and 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 uh, and the neighbourhood. Yeah, some friends of my parents live out in France, and um, she she's actually a French teacher, so so she's completely fluent in French. And people often actually think she is French, and I mean that's saying something for French people to actually think an English person is French. And, can you think of any other examples throughout your career where your language skills have come in handy? It doesn't have to be grand designs just throughout well, anything. Well, I was going to say all the time, really, because um, I, I, don't, I don't consider myself to be English as much as European. And I've lived, I lived in Italy and I've lived in France uh, for, for altogether, if you added up, for a number of years. So um, it's not so much that it was helpful somehow as a kind of, tool it was actually just a, for me it, it, the languages have allowed me to live in places mm. and travel to them and be there and work there and work in those languages um, and that's been a phenomenal privilege um, and I never thought you know when I left school that, that, that I'd be able to just move freely for most of, most of my adult life through Europe and and be able to bring to bear um, all that, you know, there's, there's that particular skill set, I suppose. And it, even in Spain, for example, I find I, could, I can often get by speaking Italian with a Spanish accent. That often does the trick. Portuguese is a bit harder. I can read, I can just about read it, but it's very hard to speak because it sounds like Russian and, and they, they drop a lot of the, the, the endings of words and they run them into, word, into one. I remember um, it was a fantastic program in Portugal years ago called Jet Set. Uh, it was about, it started out with a, a bloke looking like John Travolta in a white suit turning up at a nightclub in a red Ferrari. And it was all about, you know, the glamorous life of young sparkly people, a bit like Made in Chelsea, but this was like in the eighties. <laughs> and um, so in Portugal, and um, it was a great program and it was on uh, the national television program and it was, it, and Jet Set was pronounced in Portuguese, Jet Set, and the, 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 the 
television company in Portugal. It's, it gives you an indication of how un Latin it sounds and how Russian it sounds. It was called Radio Televisión de Portugal. And, you, you know, you, it, the noise of that language is, is so beautiful and so um, gloriously kind of mixed. And I think actually, uh, in a way, Brazilian Portuguese is probably easier, easy, easier to understand. But um, Portuguese Portuguese is, is kind of such a fantastic um, and romantic language. Um, and I've never mastered that, and I wish I had, because I think it's sort of, you know, for centuries, the two, our country and their, their country has be, have been allies. Um, and, um, you know, in Elizabeth's court, the Portuguese ambassadors were her most favoured, the most important. So, uh, I think, yeah, it would, it would have been lovely to, to, to kind of, kind of penetrated that culture a bit more, because it's so beautiful. Um, but yeah, I mean, generally speaking, of course, I mean, there are occasions, plenty of occasions where I've been in countries, Finland, for example, where nobody speaks English, surprisingly. Uh, and you try them out on a bit of German and you try them out on a bit of Italian, just in the hope that there might be some kind of, and there's no, nothing, because Finnish as a language is, is related, I think, to a, a, a variant of Hungarian, and, and it, it has no roots in the Romantic Latin traditions that form the basis of European languages. So you know, you're completely stuffed there. And, and isolated, of course, as a result. Yeah, yeah, because some, some languages link nicely, so you can sort of get away with using a bit of them, but then others are so amazingly different. I was watching something on TV, I think it was Norwegian, and I was just thinking, this is the best language ever, because it doesn't make any sense, and then all of a sudden there's basically an English word. Yeah. And it, yeah, it sounds fascinating. Yeah. It's been like listening to Welsh, which kind of stopped because of the fact that the, the language effectively died and therefore words like combine harvester yeah. <laughs> don't exist in Welsh. So they, you suddenly hear these two farmers speaking in Welsh and they suddenly say combine harvester. Um, yeah, and it, it's, it's interesting, isn't it, this way in which kind of languages fall to grow and change and adapt. Uh, um, there is, and I forget his name now, a fantastic comedian in Iceland. He's Icelandic. Um, he speaks pretty well all of the uh, Norse and uh, um, uh, languages. And you know, Danish and uh, Norwegian, Swedish, and, and I think a bit of Finnish too, as well as Icelandic. And the galling thing is he does most of his stand-up as a comedian in English, and he's very funny, which is a great uh, mark, isn't it, of some yeah. of kind of of a language. And he's very funny, because he actually does sketches about the, distinct, the, sort of the distinctions between different languages in Scandinavia and, um, and, and Finland. And uh, for example, Norwe Norwegian apparently goes up at the end of the sentence a bit like Australian does. Yeah. I, I wouldn't know, but he, no. he's very funny. Yeah, that's, you've got to be very, very good at languages to actually be able to be funny in another language, haven't you? And not just yeah. make sense. I, I think the two tests are one, being able to dream in a, in a, in a yeah. language, and the other is is being able to tell a joke. Well, anybody can tell a joke. It's telling a joke and getting a laugh. Yeah. <laughs> that, that's the hard thing. It's, it's understanding the timing of another language, you know. Yeah. Do you, do you dream in any of, have you had dreams in any well, of the languages that you speak? When I lived abroad, yes, because in France I occasionally would dream in French. Most of the dreams in French tended to be about people telling me off about my pronunciation. Um, <laughs> and in Italian, I would I happily dream uh, because I was living there at the time and, and, and really kind of got into that language, I guess. It, it suit, seemed to suit me. Um, but the, the extraordinary thing about, about, um, about Italian, learning Italian, is that you... you German, you go into a shop in Germany and you speak a little bit of German and they listen attentively and they're very caring and helpful and, and very polite and, you know, and we get on well. Um, the Italians, when you're in an Italian shop and say even buongiorno and something like this and they run about completely agog and so excited that you've even attempted to try and speak their language. In France, walk into a shop and, you know, you ask for a, uh, and you could ask for three croissants, right? You can say trois croissants, and they'll look at you and say, what? 
and, yeah. and, and so eventually you point to say three those croissants. You say, I say, oh, you mean trois croissants? And you're like, yes, that's what I said. Exactly what I said. How can I possibly have improved the pronunciation? How you know? And there is an absolute kind of reluctance to to sort of um, accept you know, that, that one is making an effort. Yeah. <laughs> um, but but um, but I do love that country. So you know, it's worth the effort. And there's something else to it, which is actually cultural, which is that when we walk into a shop in the UK. We're walking into a branch of, you know, Primark or, mm. or Starbucks or whatever, or the local, you know, timber merchants or news agents. But when you walk into a shop in France, they still very much have this mentality that you're walking into their dwelling. Yeah. Uh, and so when you walk in to a, to, to a news agent in the UK, the bell goes and you go and look at the newspapers and you pick one up and you go and say, how about you? Thank you very much. Here's the money. They say, thank you. Have a nice day. Bye. By the time you get to the till in France, they're already offended because the one thing you did not say when you walked into the shop was, hello, good morning. You know, as if, can I come in? And then, you know, they would ordinarily say, yes, of course, please come into my house, which is also my shop. Um, and, um, and that immediate um, wrong footing, by us, and, not, and uh, you know, the cultural differences between the two countries means that, you know, by the time you do get to the till and you pay for your goods, you know, there's just open hostility has broken out and, um, you know, you're about to be ejected from the buildings. Yeah, it's amazing how much, obviously, you, you can learn a language, but if you're going to go on holiday somewhere or live somewhere, there's so much of the culture to learn as well that you can understand the words, but that the language goes with um, yep. the culture to learn as well. Which makes living in another country endlessly fascinating because, of course, yeah. you will never, ever pick it all up. And not only is the culture, of course, alien and strange, but depending on where you are in the country, it, it, it will also change there as well. So there will be local customs in, in, in the northwest of France, you know, uh, which will be completely different to those in the southeast. And, um, and the same goes for Italy, too. Yeah. Mm. Can, do you have any examples that you can think of off the top of your head of any amusing translation mishaps where maybe you said something wrong or someone you, you know what? said something wrong? Yeah, I did at dinner. I said, I said, and I'm not going to tell you what it is in Italian because I'm not going to tell you how it translates either. But what I wanted to say was I wanted to use um, a, a common phrase, which in Italian is as dry as a fig. And, and, I, and I said to somebody at the table, and it was, actually, it was a restaurant, I think. I was, I was complaining. I said, this meat is as dry as a fig. And I, I didn't use fico, which is the masculine of the fig. I used the word fica, which means something entirely different. And it, it refer, it's, a, it's a genital term. But it, it, it basically silenced the room. And you think they would have given me a little bit of allowance, you know, for just that slight slip of gender between masculine and feminine. Hey, apparently that's not going to be a future, a problem in the future, because there, there are movements now in Europe to um, degender language so that it becomes gender neutral. So things just become what a, you know, they just have a single ending, which is going to be hard in languages like Italian, because uh, an apple tree is male, but the apple fruit is female mm -hmm. um, in terms of gender. And but that's expressed by the ending. So uh, o for male, a for female. So un melo is an apple tree, una mela is an apple. Well, if you kind of, you know, if, I suppose if you're going to blend them into a gender neutrality, then what we're going to end up with is a good kind of fogging and mushing of, of uh, terms. I don't mm. know. Maybe it was your restaurant faux pas that instigated that. Maybe they were like, we need to change this so this doesn't happen again. I just think it was. <laughs> Potentially. <laughs> um, you've spent many years championing conservation and sustainability in mm. architecture. And when talking about Grand Designs' achievements in the past, you've said that yes, it might have popularised underfloor heating and things like that, but you'd like to think that it's further the causes of sustainability and green construction. How does sustainability in architecture work? So what is Grand Designs or any other projects doing to address that? Yeah, so, well, I mean, I think we have to look at sustainability just in, simply in terms of the Brundtland Agreement, 
1983, I think, uh, 87. It's a while ago now, isn't it? Um, 87. And it was a conference held and uh, an agreed term or agreed definition of sustainability, which is about resource use. So it's saying we should be conserving the resources of the planet in such a way as to provide for our needs, but to provide equally for the needs of future generations. In other words, there is only so much, we have to share it out, uh, and we have to be very careful in the way that we use resources in such a way that they are renewable, re recyclable, have minimal environmental impact, that, you know, maintain biodiversity and all this kind of thing. Now we've got very hung up because of climate change, we've got very hung up on carbon because it is the one, it's the single biggest threat. Um, it's a bit highly complicated, of course, because we've got issues around um, forest deforestation, forest use, uh, forest product use, um, issues around plastics, um, oil, fish, water, um, population growth, which is, of course, at the bottom of it all. Um, but uh, as a result, we've kind of, I think, slightly lost sight of the, the bigger picture. So when people talk about sustainability, they think very much about fossil fuel use mm -hmm. and carbon. And, uh, and actually, it's much wider than that. It's, it's also to do with resource use, generally speaking. And I, I'm quite, I, I keep trying to sort of remind people it's about resource use in every respect, food, um, human resource, uh, timber, fish, the rest. And, and metal, of course. Um, so uh, we only have a finite amount. We only have one planet. So uh, there is no planet B. We, 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 we've got to kind of share it out and figure out ways of sharing and, and, and making our lives less impactful and uh, more, um, more and lighter, if you like, on the, on, the, on the planet's surface. So in terms of the projects we like to cover, they're all of them, for a start, as a benchmark, you know, super insulated, many of them with mechanical ventilation, heat recovery systems. Uh, many of them are, are, are low energy in use, but you know, all that's dealing with is the carbon, it's dealing with the fossil fuel thing. What really interests me is when we start building with materials that have you know, low environmental impact, such as um, uh, specific types of very um, high performing concretes and cements that have you know, low, a lot of recycled material in them, um, like blast furnace slag and pulverized fly ash. Uh, when we build with stone and wood and local materials, um, when we actually invest in craftsmanship in materials and in, uh, in, in the built environment, because crafted things last longer, partly because they're better made, uh, and partly because we value them. We have a relationship with crafted things that grows with time uh, and means that we look after them more. So um, I'm not a fan of the throwaway society. And I think, I think, with grand designs, yeah, for us to, to film an expensive, wasteful building that uses lots of resources and then starts to leak because it's so badly built, that would be an anathema to me. You know, we, we, we actually do live in a country where, where our housing stock is pretty poorly constructed generally. And so to show people how well it can be made and how durable and resilient it can be, all the better. Sustainability is a very big topic in all classrooms, but particularly the language classroom at the moment. Um, what can people do or keep in mind around their own homes to help with the sustainability issue? And what can even our youngest little students be encouraged to do or look out for around their own homes? Well, to answer the first question, I think we can all, we can all stop you know, obsessing over photovoltaics and bolt on technology which is very exciting, but actually not as helpful as properly insulating your home. And so putting secondary glazing in, for example, uh, triple insulating the attic, uh, stopping up the drafts, uh, insulating under your floorboards if you have a cellar. Um, even then going as far as externally insulating buildings and, and, and you know, putting in ventilation systems and so on. I mean, it is possible to take a historic building and, and kind of completely remodel it so that it is zero carbon. I've had a go at this and it's, it can be done, but you need to be very careful about uh, damp, about moisture and about uh, air quality in the building. And so it needs quite a lot of intervention to actually uh, help it work properly. And it needs the right materials, which are breathable, of course, as well in, in old buildings. So it's complex, but all of us can, all of us can put another pullover on 
And all of us can uh, turn the thermostat down and secondary glaze our windows and, and put more insulation in the attic. We can recycle more, we can waste less, we can share more with our neighbors. We can set up a car club in our street. We can uh, buy an electric car or an electric bicycle, you know, uh, or we can set up an electric car club in our street with our neighbors. We can grow our own vegetables and we can show our children how to do the same thing. We can fly less, we can walk more, we can cycle more take the train more and all of these things reduce our collective carbon and environmental footprint and impact but they also of course they promote sharing which of itself is a very socially um it's a resilient thing it helps boost resilience so that when you know when the big enemies come whether it is covid or whether it is uh, rising sea levels or whether it is uh, smog in our cities we 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 don't need to cower as individuals or as families we can, as communities and as neighbourhoods, act together. There's a huge strength and power and resilience in, in communities and, and people working together. So strength in numbers, and that only comes from the sharing of what we have in the first place. Um, as to the kids, you see, I turn it completely on, on its head here because um, I don't think of children aged six or ten as having a responsibility to do anything except to remind us you know, they're the next generation. They are the people that are going to be dealing with rising sea levels, mm. with a changing environment, with a remarkable changes to, to the, the, the natural environment, uh, and with rising global temperatures and, and resource problems and overpopulation and large-scale migration around the planet. And these are enormously, potentially enormously destabilizing uh, events, which... which I'm unlikely to see, frankly. So it's very important that my children and my grandchildren, when they arrive, remind me of my responsibility. That's all they have to do, because they're going to have to deal with it as adults. They are just children. What do we do? What responsibility do we have in teaching them? Well, that's making them aware of the responsibility they will have and the difficulties they will face in order that they can give us a hard time. Yeah, giving the kids the power to remind to remind the adults because kids are kids are very aware. They know that this that this is a thing and that adults need to be acting. So. Yeah, and it's why Greta is such a powerful individual on the planet yeah. because she started as a child, saying exactly that, calling out the adults, naming them, shaming them, mm. saying no, this isn't good enough. Yeah. Um, one more question for you, Kevin. Um, could you just give a word of advice for people learning languages today? Go to the place. It's simple. It's the simplest thing. Because if you're, the, why are you learning a language in the first place? I mean, in a way, you know, what's the point? And, and it may be that you think, well, it'll advance my career. But more than likely, it's because you enjoy it mm -hmm. and because you're fascinated by it what it represents and now a language only springs alive when you visit a place even reading a book in a foreign language doesn't you're reading it if you're reading it in your own country you're, you're reading it in the context of your own culture reading that book in another country drinking their coffee drinking their wine eating their bread breathing their air that that's a, a, a huge privilege and a massive pleasure and i think um yeah, it, it opens doors enormously. It's like having another passport, I think, having a language. And I think it, it, it just allows you almost to be someone else in a different place, to explore a different part of yourself. So you, but you can only do that if you are there. You know, you, you, can, you can learn at school. And so for so many of my friends at school, I remember language, it was just a dull subject I had to do. It was compulsory. And because I studied it at primary school, by the time I was 13, I was going on French exchanges and staying, and we had kids over and had, you know, friends over, but they were friends and people I continued to see um, who, from France uh, and Germany, actually, who would come and stay with my family and I go and stay with them for two weeks every year. And it was cool. It was organized by the local town, but it was, it was an insight suddenly into how other people lived. Yeah, they weren't foreigners anymore. 
Yeah, I ne never did an exchange an exchange at school. I went to um, Paris, etc., but we never did the exchange thing. Kind of wish, kind of wish I had done. Um, well, yeah, the difficulty about the school trip is you're with your mates, you're speaking English. Yeah, Whereas exactly. If you're with a family around a table and they ask you a question in another language, and you 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 know you can you can sit miserably for two weeks and and you know pretend it isn't happening, but actually the best thing is to engage. Yeah, and you're eating the food that they would eat and doing the things that they would do whereas on a school trip you can order yourself a bowl of chips if that's if that's what you want yeah exactly exactly yeah um kevin thank you for for speaking me for speaking to me today that was that was really interesting to hear about opera and architecture and um all the different ways that languages can well be involved in just one person's experience so um, and thank you thank you for your advice about reading in different languages and having a motive behind learning a language because yeah there's so many people out there learning learning today and working really hard at it so yeah um, and you know what i don't think you need a lot of money to do it either i worked in a pub for three months before i went to italy and i'd saved up enough money for my fare and i had enough to pay for my bed and board for um three weeks and i ended up staying you know like a year and 15 months just and it's possible to it's possible to do it on a shoestring that's what i mean you know you don't you don't you don't need to be fancy and um i think there is that and i think brexit has only made perhaps our perception of europe as a distant place worse whereas in fact it's somewhere where we you know that belongs to us culturally and and we have such connection with it that it would you know one shouldn't be too scared of exploring it Hopefully, once all this COVID business is out the way, we'll all be able to actually go and visit our friends in other countries yeah. again, yeah. again soon. So, um, in the yeah. meantime, we can, we can maybe all, if you're really keen, just just find a find a conversation pal in another country who wants to become mm. friends by a Zoom. Yeah, it's a good idea. I I did a ski season, so I've got friends from France and Spain and things. So I should I should get on the phone to them, but make them not speak to me in English because <laughs> that's, yeah. that's the easy way out. The hard thing. When they all speak English so well, yeah, it's the hard thing. <laughs> yes, I know. Well, the thing is, they're, the Spanish ones and the French ones, they could all swap between those languages and speak to each other yeah. and then I'd show up and I'd, they'd see them go, blah, blah, Lauren, English, and they start speaking English. <laughs> so, yeah, I'll have to, I'll have to up that one, so. Um, yeah, um, thank you again, Kevin, for, for speaking to me today. That was really interesting. Good fun. Thank you. Yeah.